Welcome to Gem Collectors with Sean, and uh, we are rocking and rolling right along. Um, boy, I'm Sean, and for those of you that haven't watched this show before, or really that familiar with it, just a couple reminders is you can order 24-7. We, uh, the, as a network, have been here 26 years. We're uh, nationwide, international, in all kinds of uh, those social media sites I don't know much about, but <laughs> we, uh, whatever, are linked to them uh, or have them. I'm not the guy. I'm a rock guy. If you put ITE at the end of something, I might know what it is. Uh, television night. Yeah, I know what it is. So, um, if you all of a sudden decide that you want to watch this show, which there are many others other than the new one that comes out every Monday, and you see something you like, write down the item number. Because it, even though uh, items stay, like in other words, whatever I show today, it'll stay in what we call in uh, as a memo and available for purchase for three to four weeks. Um, some of the items today I'm going to show you aren't going to be out that long. And when we get to them, I'll tell you, you'll know why. Um, so after that, the items are returned to me. In other words, they're set aside in the vault, ready to be shipped at any moment. In other words, if you call up and you want something, it will ship that day. If you um, see something from a past show, and the sales rep just says, we don't see that as being in the system, or we don't see that as being available. If they say, oh, we see that that's been sold, then end of story, nope, gone. If they say, well, we don't see that, that it's been sold, and it says not in the system, what that means is, I still have it. And if I show it again in another show, then it would be, um, you'd be able to uh, see it and uh, have, you know, start over. But, but if I have it and you have the item number, I go through the inventory with a description of it. We know where our stuff pretty much is, except for <clears throat> a couple of chair whites that mysteriously disappeared. Um, yeah, I want to find them still. Um, so we may very well still have those items. All right, so. Um, We've been doing the podcast for seven years. Uh, actually, towards the end of, of this, <laughs> this month, I think Miss Gabby uh, knows the date better than, better than we do. Um, and prior to that, I did a live show here at uh, Gem Shopping Network that this show, of course, is part of. Um, you can access, though, this show through uh, YouTube or directly through the uh, gemshopping.com website. So you can um, uh, check out also 30 different episodes titled How It's Done. And they are amazing. Uh, Asif did the camera work and it was just he and I every Friday. We'd lock ourselves in my uh, office here which has an entire workshop. Uh, entire workshop. And every Friday for the entire afternoon, and we would shoot a new episode of How It's Done. And it covers everything from watching me size a yellow gold ring versus watching me size a platinum ring and discussing the differences in the end what, um, what it takes to size both of, uh, either one of them. And why then one costs so much more to size than the other. It's easy to see and you have a better understanding of pricing that way and why something is priced as it is, to the very technical work on restoring uh, estate and antique rings, which of course I had a jewelry store in downtown Chambly, which is a um, antique district within the perimeter of Atlanta and um, uh, is known for in it, its antiques in that, in that district. And so um, I show you how not only how it's done but also how mill grain is restored that's that little beaded edge you get to see the tools equipment you get to see me do it i also though go into flush setting bead work bead setting you know bright work um bezel setting 
you name it, making a bezel. <laughs> because we cover a piece where I totally make it from carving the wax, then I make another piece that would, uh, under the uh, FTC, Federal Trade Commission's guidelines of what something has to be to be handmade, I demonstrate and make start to finish a pendant that would um, adhere to those guidelines and so therefore can be represented as being handmade. And that's where I actually alloy the metal, the rose gold. I roll out the rose gold. I saw out the pendant. Uh, there's even a little uh, piece that uh, I made spin for a little extra pizzazz. So you're going to see a, just a really wonderful something, wonderful handcrafted. So uh, there's so much information there that you can watch those and just be entertained. At the end of it, I, I, I told Austin that someone should get, if they watch all 30 episodes, they should get some kind of certificate because the level of knowledge you would have would far exceed 95% of the people called, I call them clerks, that work in mall jewelry stores, even the managers, uh, jewelry stores in general. So that level of knowledge, you'd have to have worked in a jewelry store where there's a custom uh, goldsmith or um, like Asif worked in an environment around where you could see limitations and what's been done and, and what can and can't be done from jewelers over the many years. You know, you have to, you would have to have some kind of affiliation, but all you have to do, watch those 30 episodes and you will talk the talk and um, it may spur a, uh, and kindle up talent within you you never knew you had and maybe you want to try it yourself. It certainly is a lot of enjoyment and fun. Something I have been doing, uh, which is uh, the gem cutting came first at 11 years old, silversmithing at 15, um, because I was already by then tired of having uh, the hippies. Well, it was the, um, call it the le a leather smith shop in downtown Main Street in Sarasota, Florida. And in the, the, for a while, they would put me in the window and uh, pay me, I think, $5 an hour to cut gemstones in the window of the leathersmith slash uh, silversmith shop. And so uh, that was really interesting. That was a lot of fun. Um, it was in an area, this is a neat little anecdote to that. Uh, not many people know, but the <laughs> only later in life did I actually put the two and two together that um, where the leathersmith shop was was literally only about four businesses up from the uh, um, little theater that Pee Wee Herman was caught in. Um, yeah, if you remember that, yes, it was Sarasota. Oh, yes, yes, oh, it was a movie theater. Yes, yes. So um, <laughs> that was kind of the area I was in, but it fit perfect because the artsy area, uh, you know, and you're talking about 1975, 1976 or so, and um, that was that was the time that was there, and uh, I was uh, I, I thought it was pretty cool just getting to sit in the window and do that. So, um, but I did figure out and learn that I didn't want to have to farm out my silver work, you know, to someone else to do it. So, I uh, quickly and handily started picking up silversmithing, uh, goldsmithing at 17, and then just barreled on from there. And of course, later in life, <laughs> prospecting. It wasn't much later because of course, going to my uncle's farm, it was um, concurrent with everything else. But when I really got to, uh, uh, on a more serious level, of course, was when you know I had my, my digger, my, um, my backhoe and excavator and, oh, yes, maybe one day I'll, I'll uh, be able to get it back. The price COVID paid. Okay, I have a lot to get to today. You know me, though. You uh, give me a green light, and uh, I just start talking, and none of it ever, ever, ever scripted. And that's why it's such a uh, fresh and um, transparent show, and uh, very candid. Everything is very candid. All right, so we had two trivia questions last week, and so those questions are, and remember, I always say, pay real close attention to exactly how I word the question. Question number one was, what is the name of the most common variety of tourmaline? 
What was the name of the most common variety of tourmaline? And the answer being Elbite. Now, uh, a little bit of extra credit I think I mentioned was, and then tell me where uh, it was originally found and what its type locality, in other words, what was it named for, Elbite. And that, of course, is the island of Elba in the Mediterranean, um, especially back in historical times. Uh, that's still called that for an island. Okay, question number two was what element, now he, here's the question that you really have to listen to exactly how I uh, worded it. What element, comma, due to radiation, comma, is responsible for ametrine's color? Now, what element due to radiation is responsible for ametrine's color. Now that can be a little confusing sounding, sounding like I was asking for um, what element was the radioactive element, whereas I actually asked for what element due to radioactivity, you could say, due to radiation, what element due to radiation is responsible for ametrine's color? So um, it's the element we're looking for that is altered by radiation that is Earth's natural radiation, and in this case, it's potassium-40. So um, what element due to radiation is responsible for ametrine's color? The answer being, um, iron, or it's actually uh, the valence of iron, Fe3 plus to Fe4 plus. Uh, so um, that's the answer we're looking for. But just iron is, it would have been a, a fine answer. So now let's l read it. What element due to radiation? So we could substitute what element due to potassium 40? is responsible for ametrine's color, and that would be iron. So, you know, putting it that way, um, uh, of course, the extra credit part on that is what element caused the, um, uh, what, what element was the radioactive element, which would be, you know, potassium would be close enough instead of, instead of the isotope potassium 40. So, um, what element due to radiation or what element then due to potassium 40 is responsible. So what is um, most important is the iron part because it is a uh, iron that creates both um, colors and that is um, interesting in itself. So all right let's get to the um, Comments. Cindy in Pennsylvania says, hello, Rock family. Wow, wow, wow. That was a show. I loved it. Sign me up for all the thousands in treasures you showed. The eclipse was very cool. I would compare it to a dark gray thunderstorm in daylight. Only a sliver of the sun at the height of the moon passing in front of it. Um, trivia, amethyst color develops when iron-containing quartz is exposed to potassium-40. So as long as you get the iron in there. And question number two, Elbite tourmaline with origins on the island of Elba in the Mediterranean. Very good. Going to the rock and mineral garage sale, the man I know has two times a year on Friday. That would be really cool. Um, he always has great surprises. I haven't made it inside yet, but he mentioned it. I bet it is a treasure chest throughout. Sound familiar? <laughs> LOL. Indeed. I don't think um, many of you would get much past the front door. I mean, yeah, you'd get a foot in the front door, but we have right there, oh, I don't know what you call it, one of those entrance tables or something. And top layer, middle layer, and on the floor underneath. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Huh. Anyway. 
Um, yes, it does. <laughs> Till next week, Cindy in South Central Pennsylvania. Thank you, Miss Cindy. Mr. Anthony says, hello all, just another show where I wanted everything. However, I did score the Black Lightning Ridge Opal and the Jadeite Frog. That Jadeite Frog was way too cool. A really super deal. And could you imagine sitting there and doing all that intricate carving in that piece for so little money? Um, and actually being able to carve and figure out how to get a frog out of that piece. That was just uh, clever. And why I loved items like that, because it really took a lot of um, neat lapidary work. But someone mentioned <laughs> jadeite, so I started pulling out some jadeite for you. And that Lightning Ridge Opal, mm, beautiful, beautiful gem. Um, so trivia on number one, you got an L by is the answer there. Um, we, uh, of course, were looking for um, what is the name of the most common variety of tourmaline? And so, Elbite, you got that right on. Question number two was what element due to radiation is responsible uh, for ametrine's color? That's the one that was a little confusing, I could see how, but again, it's those tricky words. I gotta make somewhat, something hard for, for all of you. And um, uh, I have um, something I'm gonna send you there, Mr. Anthony. So um, I mentioned it last week, so keep an eye out for that. Um, but anyway, well, well done on uh, getting those answers uh, correct. He goes on to say, Mr. Anthony says, Sean, I knew you would have info on the volcano, but not to the extent you projected. However, as I listened to you with my jaw dropped, um, naming neighborhoods and a beach Nantasket in the town of Hull, the Blue Hills, Hyde Park, I will be doing my own research now as well. A match was lit, but you started a fire. Thank you. I left a note for people that have the feldspar on their property. I used my welder's glasses as well to see the eclipse. We got about 93% partial eclipse right about the time the podcast started. Sorry about that. Um, it was like 83 or something percent here. But like I said, you know, um, it, unless it was really uh, far up there, even a little sliver of sun left, you know, leaves a lot of light still to get through and when but but what it does if you have enough it does cast a eerie kind of glow or color over everything and um it uh still gives you a uh, experience that you really hadn't felt or or seen uh much before that would be in the 90 plus you know but you know for us it just had 83 percent if you didn't know an eclipse was going on, um, you wouldn't have, a cloud could have passed over and you would, have, you would have thought just maybe a cloud moved in front of the sun kind of thing, and that would be it. But, Mr. Anthony, that's exactly what I um, uh, loaned to Raven because um, she was here at the network that day and I wasn't, so she was glad because no one else had any glasses, so they all uh, in, uh, in her office shared her glasses uh, that I gave her, which were exactly welder's glasses, which you can't beat. Welder's glasses are, you know, exactly um, super protective. And so um, I had another pair at home and, and I got to looking at it. But even, even at that, the sun was so powerfully bright down where I was at the percent. But I was able then to just, um, using my little fingers, block out the glare around it and I could see the perfect, um, amount and the, and, and the perfect sliver and it was a uh, still a neat a neat experience to uh, say I was there and you know didn't pass it taking a nap or something so, something like that so um, but yeah I like to hear everyone's different experience uh, about it I I could never do any better than the, in 2017 when I actually went to the center line uh, and it happened to pass right over Chunky Gal. And so, of course, I went up there and it was at, you know, over 4,000 foot elevation and um, had a huge panorama of the sky. And it was a really perfect spiritual experience. And it was uh, totality as long as it was um, even possible. 
which was just under two minutes. Now, for those that got to expense, experience it at twice that length of time at four minutes, oh, I would have given anything for that. So um, for a four minute experience, because yeah, just when you're like, oh, you know, still in awe, it starts becoming light again and you know it's not gonna, <laughs> that's it, that's over with, you know, for a, a long time ahead. But um, I don't, just don't remember the amount of um, hype or uh, news, um, build up, whatever you want to call it. In 2017, it just seemed like this was a much bigger deal. I think maybe because it uh, probably passed over more of the US and more of the population and maybe affected uh, the news more that way. But um, certainly it is something, if you ever have a chance to experience in the middle of the day, to go from sunlight to darkness it is completely uh, awe-inspiring uh, thing of nature. And if you didn't know what was happening or understand what was happening back in the uh, um, days of old and, and, and in the prehistoric times, you know, prehistoric man, um, wow, what that must have felt like then prior to science. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, Anthony goes on to say uh, that um, uh, I started a fire. Thank you. I left a note for the people that have the feldspar on their property. I use my welder's glasses as well to see the eclipse, um, which do work well. Yep. So, uh, yeah, that a lot of people don't realize that <laughs> right in that area that that you live, it's all part of the, the Mattapan complex, which is a um, uh, made up of a large felsic uh, volcanic field of um, rock that is a felsic being feldspar and silica. So with those two things, you have a good opportunity to find rocks associated with those. So um, yeah, there you definitely are not in what a lot of people would think of like uh, a place that is um, boring by way of <laughs> rocks and minerals. And there are kind of some places like that, but always it'll surprise you. Who would have thought Louisiana, not much for rocks and minerals, but up comes, and I have some, of course, some of that Louisiana opal, and there is such a thing. Um, I actually think I've sold some of it here. And uh, so that surprises you. Alabama, you don't think of much. Alabama has petrified wood. Georgia, of course, we know has uh, all kinds of great stuff. But um, yeah, there are those surprises out there. And um, that's what makes it so fun, is every state has something to offer. And Massachusetts, of course, Goshenite, you know? Goshen, yeah, yeah. So, okay, um, let's go on. Miss Barbara in from Brooklyn. Hi, Professor Sean, Raven, GSN crew, and the whole Rock family. Lovely array of new items, and you got through a bunch of them. Well done. Something for everyone, especially opal and tourmaline lovers. Uh, thanks for offering the fine Shattuckite. Very cool acicular crystals under the microscope. As to the trivia, Elbite is the variety of tourmaline named after one of Napoleon's exile islands, Elba, off Italy. <laughs> so true. Ferrous and ferric iron in the presence of probable potassium-40 radiation from natural amethyst and citrine from the Anahi mine in Bolivia. You once sold a shard, a shard of this material which demonstrated the pie-shaped alternating colors next to each other around the central axis of the crystal structure. Cool. The eclipse was stunning. Hope everyone got to enjoy it, if only on TV coverage. Next one in 2044. See you there, maybe. Yeah, it's cool, of course, between amethyst and, and um, ametrine. Ms. Gabby mentions that she wasn't really familiar that there was synthetic ametrine, and it actually had been made uh, first quite some time ago. And uh, the, um, the secret had been um, uh, laid bare as to what uh, creates it and then how to determine it. But it's all about um, uh, the optic axis of the crystal. And in natural citrine, the optic axis um, is going to be um, 
parallel, parallel. And so the, uh, to, to the color. So your optic axis, and the optic axis, what that is, is in the case of um, quartz, let's say, it belongs to the hexagonal crystal system. And so it has three axes, A, B, and C. And uh, the lengthwise one, of course, right? Then you have one going this way through one side and one going through this way. And that's how it would be drawn um, as a diagram. And so two of the three will have different refractometer readings. It is the one that does not have a refractometer reading is what is referred to as the optic axis. And in a um, synthetic ametrine, the um, uh, optic axis is oblique to the color. And unlike it being parallel in a natural one, and with just a little practice and having the real thing and the not the real thing, you can determine it that way. But I am a, a one that can um, determine it without having to worry about that because you may not always be able to really find everything if it's mounted, et cetera. Pretty much zoning. Zoning and inclusions are the tell. And of course, if you see enough, also then the color. Um, even though there is nice, really fine natural ametrine, there's something about the lab-grown quartz ametrine that the color is just not the same. And um, so you saw, I think, some differences. And uh, of course, when you have all the fake stuff you want, that color delineation is always going to be perfectly straight across as opposed to the natural ametrine I, I showed you, um, it being not exactly across. That's okay. Nature isn't perfect. A, a, a lapidary who cut the stone isn't perfect. And um, only when you have synthetics is everything perfect. So um, that, that's a, uh, a couple additional things about ametrine and how to tell the difference because I know a lot of people that were really proud of their ametrine buy and uh, instead it was just throwing money away, you know. <laughs> but, you know, they, they, they strike out, they go out into the market, you know, stray away from someone they're familiar with or someone that they can go back on the item and get, get their money back. And instead, you know, these people bought from these uh, places that mostly are out of the Caribbean, where your right of return isn't what you think, and then um, your money's gone, and uh, you, you bought something that was misrepresented, so. All right, now, and if you hear the word uh, uniaxial, uh, axial, that means one axis, that is in reference, like quartz is one axis, meaning one axis, uh, the optic axis, um, one of three. So meaning it has one axis that uh, does, um, the refractive index doesn't change. The other two are uh, different and uh, from each other. Um, and the uh, third one, um, it, it, um, it um, double refraction doesn't occur. So the other two, when you rotate it on a refractometer, you get the high and low on. The third, or the optic axle, or the uni, uh, optic axis, it doesn't change. It doesn't have a double refraction, and that's how you would tell uh, and, uh, as a crystal. 
All right, Miss Elisa in Florida says, hello, Professor Sean, love you, Ray, and GSN crew and Rock family. Thank you for the great information and lesson on Amatrine, but I also love seeing the amazing opals and stunning jewelry pieces you made. Sean, I'm excited to see what else you have to show us. My answer to this week's trivia are Elbite. The origin of the name is from the locality of the island of Elba, Italy, the element affected by radiation that causes Amatrine's color is oxygen, a more depth in-depth answer would be iron oxide. I'm glad you got the more in-depth answer um, being uh, and saying iron oxide. Still, it's more like a iron uh, valence change of uh, Fe3 plus, Fe4 plus. It actually swaps out initially, it goes through two changes <laughs> um, and Fe3 plus interchanges with silicon, but we won't go that far. Uh, but, but it is really amazing what it does go through to uh, bring us that unique color. Um, the natural occurring radiation is potassium 40. My favorite item of the week was the blue violet amylite. Have a good week, everyone. Miss Elisa, yes. Oh my, if that didn't get everybody's motor running. I don't see where anybody has said they bought it yet, so we shall see. Miss Gabby in Florida says, greeting one and all, so many nice gems and even nicer prices on today's show. Miss Gabby would know for sure. I have to admit, I would not have been suspicious of that large amatrine. I have seen Mother Nature do some pretty amazing and just about perfect things, in my book anyway. Now something else I have to be weary of, LOL. Trivia, Elvite name for the island in the Mediterranean and the exposure to the Earth's natural radiation or iron in the quartz causes the different colors in Amatrine. Which came first, the radiation symbol or Amatrine? I like that, I like that, that's funny, the chicken or the egg. Um, the radiation symbol or the radiation, that is, um, the different colors, which makes, of course, that neat wheel. And I meant to bring in the slice I have that's mine that I'm going to keep as long as I can that shows that again. And um, I'll bring it in next week so you can see exactly what that looks like. For those that have not, love and hugs to all Miss Gabby. Love and hugs back to you there, Miss Gabby. And um, it already seems like it's getting hot here in Georgia, something I do not look forward to. But um, Miss Gabby gets to escape it as she goes about to all these awesome places. Um, you need a um, <laughs> someone to carry your luggage? <laughs> I would be happy to. Um, let's see, okay. Now, let's see, did you? So you got all your answers right. So then we have Miss Matthew in Texas. Greetings, rocks and mineral <laughs> fiends. Can't wait for the next episode. <laughs> Trivia, name of the most common variety of tourmaline, origin of name, Elbi, Elba Island in the Mediterranean, Tuscany, Italy, what element due to radiation, again, what element due to radiation is responsible for Amatrine's color plus general source? Recognized for the natural radiation in the ground. Potassium 40 and the Bolivia Anahi, Anahi mine, not exactly sure how they uh, pronounce that, but um, so the um, question what element due to radiation? is responsible for amatrine's color. So remember, we talked about substituting potassium 40. Actually, it should read what element due to, instead of saying radiation, say potassium 40. What element due to potassium 40 is responsible for amatrine's color? And as I had mentioned, it is iron. It is a uh, valence change in the iron, which um, creates uh, that color change, and that's all it, all it takes. So, um, quite an, an amazing thing Mother Nature is indeed. So, um, that's where, uh, what element due to radiation, you can see where, trick question, you could uh, perceive it at, but again, why I say to make sure you read carefully, but well done to you anyway, Mr. Um, Matthew, and um, 
in Texas. Uh, and I'm glad you're watching the show and enjoying it so much. All kinds of goodies gonna be coming up for you. We got a great show planned. I'm not gonna give away any hints, but wait until you see what. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna hold off on some of the Sean made items, but no, nah, you're gonna get to see him. I was actually gonna put him in a, in a um, vendor show first, but nope. I said, you know, all of you deserve to see them in my show first. That's why the jewelry will probably not be on um, uh, memo, or in other words, available for very long, maybe only a week after uh, the show post, um, maybe only a few days. So um, I'll, I'll give enough time to, to watch the show and get it because it's gonna be such stunning, um, stunning prices um, indeed. So in today's show, we have the winner, and the winner would be Miss Gabby. You did it. Well done, Miss Gabby, to you. Let's show Miss Gabby what she has won, and uh, check it out. Look at that. Look at that. That is, of course, a beautiful Brazilian rutilated quartz, and this, these are the um, really fun collector ones, and let me show you. It has, of course, if it had a star uh, in it, it would be um, quite, quite the piece, but, but it quite doesn't. It does have, though, as we look at this, a little bit of um, hematite. Look at that. So as we come, here we go. You can see the wonderful, wonderful rutile needles golden rutile and right down at the bottom which is now right there at the top you can see a little bit of uh, black right there at the edge right there that's some hematite right there but look at the golden rutile love that stuff and a marquee shape you actually don't see too many of those so well done to you miss gabby I am going to put this away. And uh, also is the one that suggested put it in a suspension box. And he was right. Good way to display it. All right, I'll be right back with the start of the show. Oh, talk about blue. You know, I can't, for so many years, people, uh, it took a long time to get over people thinking that a inky black sapphire is valuable. And so in my jewelry store, I used to say, okay, I'd show, I'd have one ready. I have an inky black sapphire and I'd have a nice, beautiful color one like this. And I'd say, okay, if both were the same amount of money, which would you prefer? And of course, 100% of the people would say the one with the beautiful blue color. I said, so therefore, if everyone would prefer the beautiful blue color, you know, why would you feel that something that does not even look blue be of uh, considered of more value? And, and so on logic, everyone, uh, it was easy to explain and understand that. But it was all about marketing. It's because for so long, rings, all they, that ever were put in them were those really dark black, inky, blue, whatever, uh, cheap, cheap sapphires. So um, slowly the market realized that blue it means blue, not midnight black <laughs> or anything else, but a beautiful color blue. And this is a beautiful color blue. Now, as a gem cutter, and if any of you others are out there, you can look at this stone and see that there is a, what we call a window. And this is a perfect um, educational stone for uh, the meaning of a window. So a window is exactly that. What do we have a window at home for? So we can see straight through to the outside world. And that's what this does. It has no refraction of light much back through the middle. No sense in me not telling you that because it's, gonna, it's obvious that it does that. Now, as a cutter, you can make this a little smaller dimensionally, but uh, it will give you enough ability depth wise to be able to change the angles uh, to where they're um, 
above the critical angle and so that light doesn't pass out and through the stone but is retained in and bounced back up and out. Now, that set, even if you don't recut the stone, it's a beautiful sapphire. And by the way, I don't have the ruby on today, but here, I want to show, I forgot about this. Um, yeah, Raven let me borrow her ring. And that may be part of a uh, trivia question at the end of the day. So I'm not gonna tell you what that is. I'm just showing you relative to my hand the size. Look at that color blue though. I mean, that is like the blue on the Gem Shopping logo you see in the corner of the screen. Here's the other ring I'll give you a quick glimpse of. And that may be part of a trivia question as well. All right, now this has um, exactly eight by six dimensions. So perfect calibration. It is a carat 35. This stone has the color of a very expensive color. It's got fantastic clarity, very little zoning in it actually. So it's a nice stone, especially if you want to consider, I'm gonna offer that for only $68, which is $50 a carat. Yep, only $68 and wow, eight by six millimeter. And here's the fun thing, as if you're a cutter, like, um, you know, Harry, Anthony, Charles, you can um, just lose maybe a half a millimeter in each direction, which gives you a thick enough girdle to be able to recut just the pavilion just the pavilion, and that way you go for minimal weight loss, and uh, you'll see that the critical angle, I think for the pavilion, it was half hours like 30, maybe seven degrees, 38 degrees, but it, either way, you'll be able to um, clean up the pavilion, and wow, take that gem and get a um, beautiful uh, dispersion out of the uh, stone, and you will have something worth uh, considerably more than it already is worth considerably more than the $68. Uh, <laughs> some great stuff to show you, but I just don't know how long I am going to uh, tease holding out on you before I show it to you. Item number 117-4324. 117-4324. Gonna have a uh, little more fun with some gemstones here. Now, since we were talking about amethyst, um, it would only be fair if we talked a little bit about, boom, its counterpart, citrine. You know, I had this whole thing planned out where I actually brought some white pieces of paper. Look, see? White pieces of paper right there. And I was going to diffuse the light through my flashlight. So you can make your own home diffuser. And all you need, depending on how strong your light bulb is, and Dave will give me just a little room here. So here is, of course, you know my flashlight. And so to break down direct light, here would, is my, would be a homemade diffuser. And then you can set the stone on top of it. You can even uh, make a little depression in this so it holds it and whatnot. And what that does is instead of getting just a bright glare of the light, it gives you a softer glare. And you can put two pieces of paper, three pieces of paper, whatever you deem uh, gets you to the level of um, background diffusion you want. Now, what that does is the same thing this white tray is doing. Let's look at this. And you can see that white tray is allowing us to be able to see the citrine in a way where that allows us to see the zoning. And I'm gonna point that out to you in just a moment. And once you see the zoning, then you know you have a genuine citrine. Because guess what? Yes, just like Amethyst, they're making all kinds of lab-grown citrine. And one of the things, though, they cannot do is they cannot create a zoning factor. And even from GIA alone, GIA articles state that zoning is one of the ways to be able to tell. Because a Amethyst of any size or citrine of any size it is going to have in some direction, um, really 95% of the time, uh, some type of color difference that will tell you that it is a natural stone. Now, let me show you. This 
not only is it actually a beautiful color, it's more of a classic color for citrine. And you can see right back there uh, the um, layers of color. And then you can also see over here that uh, it's uneven, it's uh, more clear, but it's due to a good job of the cutter that has been able to cut this stone so that those are not visible. Now, look at this from the backside. Yep, you see also unevenness of color, which is desirable anymore because I'm not ready to accept uh, lab-grown amethyst and citrine as the norm in the uh, market when it comes to the use of those stones. No, no. Give me a light color, genuine stone over the big fake stuff any, any time. So there was uh, other ways where you could actually see it better, but um, <laughs> with my homemade diffuser, but we're not going to spend the time on it then since I'm able to show it to you against the uh, white background of this. So same thing, that get a uh, background reflection of the color you can see down there. Look at that. Look at how strong the zoning is there versus looking at that end so you know that it's not a color reflection, that it's actually a difference in the color. Wow. Um, but I love this stone. I love the cut and the size. And I love the color. The uh, color uh, is more of the classic citrine. Now, also, the color is more of a the look of what you want if you're looking to have a look-alike for the genuine November birthstone, which is a truly imperial topaz. So. If you're trying to, to get something that looks more like your November birthstone, your original November birthstone, then this is more the color than, let's say, a Madeira citrine, which I'm going to show you in a moment. Price on this guy, you're going to love it because um, for a genuine earth mind stone, of this size and this cut. And also remember, clarity still matters when it comes to valuation. And the bigger a stone is, the harder it is for it to be uh, inclusion free, right? Uh, just due to size. So um, this one, except for the little bit of zoning, which like I said, is something that you want, uh, this stone, is a nice large stone with um, really no inclusions, even though if there were a, or I won't say no, I'm sure there's something in there, um, but it's what you would um, want to be in there uh, to be able to tell you that you have a genuine quartz. Even though, of course, citrines uh, have to go into, to be fair, uh, there are a lot of citrines that are created from treatment of amethyst. Now, when you see these citrine geodes that look like they would be an amethyst geode, except it's citrine, yes. Unfortunately, believe it or not, yes, they have ovens, and they put the whole thing in the oven, and they heat treat it, and they change the color of it. And then, of course, that's why the back of these uh, cathedrals, uh, these geodes, you see them all smooth. It's because of a plaster of Paris type of um, material that they put so that it holds and keeps everything all together as it goes through the processes of sawing and cutting. And, and then, they, of course, they paint it usually like a green color. And it makes for a nice finished product. If not coming out of the ground, out of the lava fields, it, it would not be attractive. I mean, I, there's nothing wrong with what they do because on the other side, the crystal side, that is all the way it should be, except for, as long as you understand, except for the citrine geodes because those are then um, heat treated. As uh, much as I wish it came out of the ground looking like those beautiful colors, it doesn't. Um, okay, so I was uh, going to 
show you something here for a moment. All right, price on this guy, how would you like it for, this is what's crazy, well, how many carats is that? 12.73, let's make it um, a whopping $36. $36, and um, that is like $3 a carat. Now, let me show you. I'm going to drop this other citrine in here for just a moment, and of course, this would be a extremely desirable. Let me get rid of that. Look at that blue. Look at that blue. Whew. Um, put that here. Okay. So this citrine, of course, everybody would love that, and that would be like a Madeira citrine, and it would go for, I have seen it sell for $100 a carat and whatnot, um, some big money. Well, unless we see it right here in this tray, at some particular angle that I didn't view previously, thank you, um, which I'm not seeing. So, so this stone, this stone, as I turned it around, you can see that it um, does not have any color delineations in it like that big other one, does it? I mean, uh, I'd like for it to because then I could sell it to you as a Madeira citrine. But you know what? As I looked at this at home and didn't find anything and looking at it through this method, uh -uh, I don't see anything. And believe me, there would be something. So guess what? As much as I, uh, yeah, you're only going to hear that from me and here at Gem Shopping Network where we are uh, straight up about things. Um, it's uh, lab grown, yeah, lab grown, citrine. So um, if you see it in one of your free, uh, <laughs> never mind, no, I won't. <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you because now that I taught you how to, to spot them, you'll be taking all your quartzes at home and spinning them around on a white tray and saying, uh oh. I bought from that other place a bad stump. Okay, let's look at item number 117, 4524. 117, 4524. And this is a stone you haven't seen for a while. Now, for a while here at Gem Shopping, we were really selling a lot of gemstones years ago. This was a stone we could not keep. It was um, really, really hot. And, and uh, so it still is a great stone, popular stone, but you do not see nearly as many as we used to. Let's see how that looks against that. Uh, look at this color. Look at that pink and um, with uh, the fake, or <laughs> fake orange, but the fake orange is close to the real orange. Now, this, look at how deep they cut uh, uh, Kunzites. Yeah, I'm moving him. Correct. It's not for sale. That was an educational piece. Um, Okay, now, yeah. this, this, look at that. Uh, of course, there's a variety of spodumene named after um, the world famous gemologist, uh, Kunz. And so it often will get its deeper saturation of color through depth. And so you can see that by the measurements, this is 9.4 wide by nine millimeters deep. It is as uh, deep as it is wide or something like that. Uh, in other words, it, 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 for the brilliance is fantastic. I mean, you know, there's no window in that, but uh, they certainly used plenty of, um, depth to achieve as much color as they as they could get out of it. A great stone. I haven't off oh by the way, if you like fluorescence in stones, this is one that um, will certainly fluoresce back. But but it also is ultraviolet shy. It's not something that you want to put in the sunlight. You definitely can uh, lose the color in it. The pink will fade. Um, I found out the hard way. Of course, intentionally, because I always try these things out, you know. So, uh, 
I had a, a crystal that I could experiment on. You know I'm going to do it. All right. This 8.67 carat, you know, I am um, going to make this a deal. And that would be, if I did it for, dun, dun, yep, it sounds like $52. That's $6 a carat. $52. And um, that... <laughs> Compared to the days of old, what we would have been selling that. And it's not that that stone's not worth much more than that. It's just that I'm not pricing it much more than that. I used to have to sell that material for so much more. And it's worth more than that. Just not today. I am offering deals galore. And um, as, as it was uh, notated in the comments by Miss Gabby, uh, just about how uh, inexpensive, not only were the items really cool and a wow or two, but they were very inexpensive, she said. So I was glad to see her notice that. All right, let's look at item 117-3924. This is something uh, I may have only offered one parcel before, maybe two parcels. And for as many of you uh, that actually buy the diamonds that I offer here, I'm glad you do. I'm glad you get these diamonds. Let me show you this parcel. This is a parcel that, um, let's see, what, here we go. Look at this Australian cognac earth mine. And you see why I do the earth mine anymore? Because uh, there's so much lab uh, grown diamonds that um, it's kind of, well, that market is a market that is self-defeating in its own self, you know. I remember when cubic zirconia first came out, the stones were like $100. They were really expensive. Now, the same stone would be a dollar, and, and it'd be, you know, Russian cut or some, some really well-cut stone. And it's just because everyone started making them. So, earth mined especially with um, some of the places that things like this, that again, they weren't appreciated originally, then oh, the love of the Australian diamonds really came uh, to uh, be known and, and the public got to know the material and really liked it and loved it. And so then the demand goes up, price goes up, and then, um, been a, a bit of a lull in some of the desires, but now going back up with the closing of the Argyle mine, there goes a whole avenue where getting this color diamond was a, um, well, put it this way, the pinks and the yellows and the other colors that the Argyle would produce were a byproduct of mining the other color diamonds, which were most commonly the champagnes and the better cognacs, as you can see. Now, Here's the thing about when I use the word cognac. <clears throat> cognac is a range of color anyway. Not only is the, the alcohol part of it is, um, but the description by way of the word. Now, what happens with a lot of these cognacs is you get a secondary color tone of orange. You can get a secondary color tone easily of yellow. There's often other very desirable colors. Even I have seen a, um, a brownish pink, a pinkish brown. You know, they don't use cognac for a description, so they'll use uh, the word brown, but with other uh, secondary color uh, mentions. So you can already see in this batch easily where there would be some uh, secondary colors of orange in it. I see that. And so if they were bigger, now you look at these, they're 1.9 uh, mil. Now, now, it's not that they vary 1.9 um, by two millimeters, it's actually 1.9 to two millimeters, meaning that they're either 1.9 millimeter or they're 1.2 millimeter. 
It doesn't mean that they're a wobbly wheel and they measure 1.9 in some directions and 2.0 in others, even though there's always going to be some little bit of variance, even in these small stones. When you turn them and remeasure them, they're not always perfectly round. Uh, 65 points. All right, so you have 20 stones, 65 points. Look, and if you uh, know diamond weights and do the uh, calculate the math and what they're supposed to be, these and, and so the average weight of the three stones and by way of the measurement puts them at exactly the right weight for the dimension. In other words, they're well cut. They're well cut. So you can see the secondary colors and look at how well matched they are. This is a, if you want to channel set something, this is a perfect, perfect batch. And uh, again, um, I had them for a project or projects. They came out of one piece matched. And so I'm going to pass them on to let someone else do something really neat with them because I have them priced so, well, here's the other really cool thing. Most of the cognacs and champagnes and whatnot, because of the color to them, allows you to have inclusions in them and it not be so visible. Not these. These are actually really quite clean. They're SI or better. So um, that's uh, the other thing that's different is and what's giving them the brilliance that they have is the fact that they're cleaner. There's not as much other stuff in them to cut down on that brilliance. All right, enough about them because I'm not charging enough to tell you any more than that. I'm just saying that these kind of items to find like this match and at the price I'm gonna offer, they're, they're gonna get harder to find as availability. Look at that. You know, you could, <laughs> of course it wouldn't be worth it at all, but send some of these I'm sure would get a orange for the secondary color. Uh, type thing, and that would be uh, neat to see, actually. You can also even get um, greens, brownish, green, greenish, brown, oh yeah. But that you're getting different color looks here, often because of the, uh, the angle. Overall, when you look at them straight down, they're really nicely matched for, for color <clears throat> overall. $65. Oh, that's $65. $65. So that is only $100 a carat. Only $100 a carat. Wow. So if you figure 20, that's $5 a stone. That's, what, that's the way to look at it. $5 a stone. Um, a bargain, no matter uh, which way you want to look at that. Um, okay, so let me put this guy right here. Don't want to make uh, too much of a mess in front of me. All right, now, I think it's time to show you a real dazzler. And that is going to be some of the items of jewelry that I have made that because of the situation um, with this estate, the, they come back around. So it's really neat, all the investment and people I put into all that time. Um, and I, uh, this particular family, I hadn't, you know, because of uh, here at Gem Shopping, instead of having my jewelry store and whatnot, I kind of haven't dealt much with them. But it doesn't matter. When you, you're the family jeweler for decades, when a situation arises and they need information on jewelry or otherwise, they will still call and come back to you. And that's what has happened here. And by them entrusting me to sell off the jewelry because he had made so much of it, had me make so much of it for her that um, she didn't need it all. So. She didn't necessarily know which ones were mine or which were other ones, but she just knew some of the nicer stuff you know, were items that I had made. But she had so much, she just didn't know. So some I have made, others no. You're going to see the difference because the ones I have done, I, of course, have my signature on, in them. OK, I said I was going to first put some of these with the vendors first, but no, I think you deserve to see them before anyone else. Item number 117. And, and you're going to get to learn about gemstones, too, along the way because of origin. 117-5424. Now, 
there I have, again, um, some stunning pieces to show you. And one second here. Um, they are, again, kind of a, um, a little bit of a mix, but hold on, I'm, I'm, I, I'm trying to do this to where it looks okay, but I'm not really good at it, at working with these things. Okay, let's take a look. Let me show you what you get in this piece. Look at this jewel of the Nile, the Jonas Mine. If you're familiar with Brazilian rubellite at all, the Jonas Mine would be a name that would come to mind. And this stone, of course, with tourmaline, you get a dichroic, placroic stone. In other words, it changes color with different directions. It also changes color with uh, different um, wavelengths of light, basically. So let me try something here, Dave, for a minute. Let me turn this off for a moment and let's see what kind of color. Yeah, we have a nice bronze color tone there. Um, all right, let me, let's look at this. Let's take it out of that thingy, which I don't like anyway. Let me show you in my hand. All right, there's more of the color that you're really going to see. And in the reality of it, uh, it's actually a much darker pink. Let me get my a much darker pink to where it's actually a uh, pinkish red, reddish pink, at, depending on um, the, the light. Now, let me raise this up a little bit and uh, let's see if, um, yeah, you'll get to see it against a couple of the different lights. Look, look at the cutting on this. It's fantastic. And then let me show you to the back. There we go. That's, that's the symbol. And if it ever looks really neat or stamped, then it's not genuine. It has to look sloppy, done by a left-handed person with a hand homemade tool. If it looks anything better than that, it's not a genuine signature. There you go. Of course, my uh, initials with the year I made the piece in 99. It, you'll see, if you look at, over the years, 98, 99, year 2000, very prolific for me. I did a lot of amazing bench pieces at that time. So this was at a really good time. It actually coordinates with some of the tourmaline that was coming out of the Jonas mine at the time. And I saw at a um, Tucson show one year, a piece of red rubellite tourmaline that the entire piece was easily two feet by a foot and a half by a foot. It would, I forget how many carats they estimated it would cut, but the one hunk itself was uh, selling for, and this has been, you know, 20 plus years ago, was selling for um, over half a million dollars. And to me, it looked like there was a lot of inclusions in it, like very kind of opaque, but no, they said, you know, they were holding up bright lights to it and looking at it and know that it would cut a good deal of amazing rubellites. And so at the time, there were a lot of rubellites coming into the market. And as it became known, many of them coming from the Jonas mine. If you look up um, some of the crystal specimens that come from the Jonas mine, you can easily see uh, the tourmaline that was as well. This, you can uh, recognize my work. You'll see that the bales are different. They don't look like standard um, factory bales. Um, I make them so that the catches can go through the bales. It's often so much the problem. Then the other thing is heavier. You can see it's, the uh, framework isn't hollowed out. It's, it's solid. It's thick. That's a sign of uh, my work. Small, bright diamonds. You can see that as well. These are nice goods. You can see overall the size of this piece. And again, you're going to see different colors, excuse me, uh, in this as you um, have it against different backgrounds. So now you can see more pink, less orange. And then it actually is uh, a lot of red in, in the, in, reality when I uh, when you see it in, in normal light. Look at the clarity. This is extremely clean and I am uh, there's 30 points of diamond so you have 
um, 4.40 carat center and a beaded edge. And I tell you what, I have um, here, if, if when I looked at how much tourmaline like this is selling for now, price per carat, I probably shouldn't have, there wasn't much of anything I actually found for less than 150 to 200 a carat. And um, this was across site after site after site. So uh, it, you can see this is an extremely beautiful gem, really nicely cut. And when you have this in person, you will definitely see why I have the notation of rubellite in there. But if you want a rubellite, I have something coming up for you in a moment after that, after I give you the price on this one. This one, believe it or not, <laughs> it's one of those that I'm really not believing it my, myself. But uh, I'm going to uh, offer this for only $988, $988. Uh, the tourmalines at two, okay, if you break it down, you look at the weight of the gold, if you actually factor the, the, the true value of the gold, the true value of the tourmaline, and there's absolutely no labor built in uh, for this piece. Uh, and that's in the secondary market, that's the savings you get is you don't pay for labor twice. The labor is only factored in uh, the, in the original making of it. It's paid then. All, once it trades hands beyond that, it trades in a, uh, a secondary market and labor is not ever factored as part of the pricing. I want to put that there for a reason because I'm going to show you, there we go. That's what I wanted to do. Okay, leave it there for a moment. Now, next, let's look at the comparison item. Um, and this one is from the same mine. Okay, they found in 19, it was in the late 70s when they, um, hit some stunning rubellites uh, at this mine. And they, uh, it became world famous for its rubellites. And some of the specimens are just outrageous. All right, uh, let's see. Did I give you the item number? Let me see, let me scan it. So 117-5324, all right. This is, I call it a cranberry red rubellite. Let's take a look at this. Look at this. Now, that you may say, yep, that's a rubellite. Again, there's going to be a range of colors that you will see in this, ranging um, with a little hint of purple to uh, hints of pink. We'll look at the back. Here we go. Um, S99. So I made this in 1999 as well. And some of my uh, classic styling there. So you can see the bale, how it's different. It's larger, but yet it's a perfect blend and size. And you see how the bale tapers narrow uh, to wider. You see how it's the inverse of the pear shape. The pear shape being a pear shape that is a little bit wider across there, it balances out. The bale helps um, kind of uh, counterbalance that and puts it in a, um, a, a softer evening out of the um, relative size, width versus length, that kind of stuff, you know, designer stuff. Look at the diamonds, classic diamonds. This one doesn't have a beaded edge. A beaded edge could always be added. Here is a gem, look at that, that is also very clean, very clean. Let me show you. Since this one's a little dark, it's not as easy to see as the um, lighter colored one, but we will give you, there we go. 
they uh, backlight it. And there we go, show you that it is for tourmaline. Now remember, rubellite is a type two gemstone. So it is going to be um, what's considered as commonly found with, thank you, sir, uh, commonly found with inclusions. And so to have something without inclusions would be um, quite rare. So this one only has a, um, it looked like a, a veil inclusion that's not even visible, unless that was some other reflection, but not even visible did I see it from anywhere looking <laughs> like this. So uh, again, we showed it to you in the um, most um, obvious way to be able to find any type inclusion. So that's certainly what uh, trans, uh, what you call transparent um, demonstration of the item. Wow, look at that. That is just a stunning color. And if, you know, think about it, purple is, any purple that you do see is actually a rare, more rare color in tourmaline than red, than rubellite. So any kind of, um, if you had a uh, purple stone, that would be even a um, plus on top of that. Let me see, let me look at this wavelength of light, turn this one off and then see this light. Wow, that is such a beautiful, beautiful gem. This is from a mine that is um, very well known for rubellite and for its red tourmalines. And this, believe it or not, is truly a, a pink red. Uh, it's really amazing. Okay, so you can see the two different colors coming from the same mine. And guess what? Let's make this easy. Same price, $988, your choice, $988. Both of them made my, by me in that year. They have come back to me, which um, that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. Now, give me a minute to put these up and I'll be right back. Okay, let's bring it on home, back to the Made in USA collection in Colorado specifically. I used to live in uh, Denver. Um, worked at a, uh, the university building, which was a primarily all jewelry offices. So that was kind of neat. That was prior to they made the downtown, that, what they called the mall. Took away Main Street, but um, it was neat. It was a, a great experience to work there and uh, mostly getting to pan in the still heavy gold laden streams of Colorado. Wow, if I could just run a dredge back through their tailings. But of course, Clear Creek Canyon, can't do that anymore. Um, but there sure is gold right alongside the road in, uh, in the tailings left behind. And that's how I first got hooked on panning was when my brother and I traveled out there and uh, we stopped at a guy and what he was doing was selling pans. He was actually selling pans and uh, alongside the road and he would give a demonstration. So he would literally say, take anywhere from the bank a, uh, a couple shovelfuls of dirt uh, and put it in the pan and the, um, the, the sifter. So, you know, he showed us how to um, uh, sane through the, the larger rocks or the um, uh, classifiers, they call them, and then how to, to uh, pan down a, a pan. And I tell you what, you know, I would have thought he would have put them in there if I didn't choose the dirt myself and pan it myself. Uh, and sure enough, there was maybe 10, 15 spots of color, all, all, most all, bigger than what I have found in um, my uh, discoveries. But um, it's, it's, came, all this is out of tailings where they took a big dredging unit right down through the creek, which it's this swift flowing um, mountain, mm, 
I wouldn't call it a river, but it's a little bigger than what you might call a, a creek, and uh, they have tailings from it. So this is gold that they missed. Anyway, <laughs> you can see I got a lot of feelings about that, because uh, you know I want to go back to Colorado. Colorado, you know, whether it's Mount Antero and the Aquamarine, or whether it's out in the Lake George area for the M's and I that we're looking at here, yeah, it has still some amazing geology, incredible wildlife, and of course, none of it I can afford <laughs> anymore compared to when I was a uh, lad of 20 years old. When I broke, had no money then, but could have maybe afforded something if I did. Uh, here's a great crystal representative of uh, the, um, it's the, from the KAG claim. The blue owl pocket, know exactly uh, the whens and wheres of uh, it. And um, it has, um, look at this, look at that. Some quartz with it, some of the classic smoky quartz has a little bit of everything, Clevelandite, right there. You can see the bladed crystals of feldspar. And um, then uh, it looks like most likely maybe some shoral tourmaline, which it was known for as well. So that's a little bit of everything, plus the classic color and crystal formation that you get with that material. A, a beautiful specimen, you know, one inch specimen. If you don't have an Amazonite, then you certainly need one for the collection. I am going to put this on sale price and make it only a uh, big discount, actually, $28. Only $28 now. So, uh, if you don't have one, that gives you a chance to get one very affordably. Now, let's, what do we go to next? Ah, uh, let's see. Ah, okay. Let's take a look. This is item number, item number 117, 117-4224. 117-4224. And this, if you collect items from different um, origins, different localities, you know tourmaline, of course, is found around the world. And uh, it is because it is so adaptable to all kinds of different elements that interchange with its formula. And Mozambique, yes. Now, where have you first heard of maybe Mozambique relative to tourmaline? Well, I know a number of years ago when the um, copper tourmalines were really uh, a buzz. Of course, there was the Paraiba ones, uh, but the Par <laughs> Paraiba ones that came from everywhere but Paraiba which is a specific state in Brazil where the original copper-bearing tourmalines of the original colors were and name was coined. Well, after much uh, debate and some lawsuits and whatnot, um, it was determined that tourmaline, as long as it was copper-bearing, could be called Paraiba um, in, in the market. and, and uh, you know, for a while it was Paraiba-like, you know, tourmaline, and, and it, it was crazy, but it, it got too uh, difficult to be able to try, to try to put that kind of control on people that, you know, had copper-bearing tourmaline and, you know, from Mozambique and wanted to call it Paraiba. Well, you know, I guess it, the right thing ended up to be that uh, less confusion, and that usually ends up to be the right, the right thing. So as long as the actual origin is stated, because at the time I was selling Mozambique Pariba, Nigerian Pariba, Brazilian Pariba Pariba, you know, it, it was uh, kind of funky. So yeah, the same kind of geology, it was uh, uh, in Ni uh, Nigeria as was, um, um, in South America, and so you had some similar stones. Also, Mozambique um, had 
tourmaline with a uh, copper impurities in it, yet it wasn't the green or the blue. And so come to find out there was red tourmalines that were called copper bearing tourmalines because they had copper in them. And, and uh, you know, they kind of said it intensified the color. Well, you know, I'm sorry, I've seen rubellite super intense colors that hadn't, you know, hadn't seen a, an atom's worth of copper. So you couldn't always claim that copper made them better. But, um, but yeah, so there was all this floating around. This is just your regular old Mozambique tourmaline. And from what I'm seeing now, the color is captured perfectly as to what I am seeing with my eye and what I see on the TV. It's really, it's really uh, uh, yeah, capturing that color, which is a, a, a pink to red with a uh, spot of copper in it at times. So um, because of the two things going on with tourmaline, it is placroic, meaning it changes color um, three or more colors underneath different wavelengths of light. Then it is um, also changes with um, the direction that you look at it. So if you look at it from one way, one angle, it's going to be one color, and a, another angle, a different color. Um, so that's uh, part of the, the placroism to it. And then you have the, um, the stone that cha it's changing color due to difference in wavelength of light. So that can occur as well. But look at that. That is just a really pretty, nice, um, pleasing color that actually has several shades from a uh, wonderful kind of coppery color. And let me see on this one. Yeah. Um, this this is uh, one from my collection, but just so that you it's not misinterpreted. Um, it's not one I cut. It would say cut by Sean, or I'd word it differently. Then then you see. you you have it right there. It's just that I didn't want it to interpret it right. Look at that color though. It is a very clean stone. This is actually a fantastic cut. I, I would easily uh, put my name to the cutting on this one. Um, it just uh, is really pleasing. And, and you can see just a, um, a little bit of uh, difference in shading. And, and look, look at that strong pinks. You can already, you know, it really is uh, a different color than it was a moment ago. And uh, the fun of tourmaline, huh? Really it is. I saw much more copper and um, I don't know, maybe it's going to be one of those that uh, changes with heat or something. There is such a thing. Okay, so price on this one you know these kind of tourmalines go for a huge amount of money. I actually looked them up. Oh, this is from a, a unique mine, a different mine also. So this mine in Mozambique, if you have a Mozambique tourmaline, most likely it's going to be from this mine, the uh, Naipa mine. And so uh, that would be a great stone to add to your collection. Uh, if, if you, for those of you that collect origins, um, yeah, this would be a good one. Now, price-wise, this is only, especially when you consider what these go for in a price per carat situation. I hadn't priced tourmaline like that in a while, and I, my jaw was dropping. I have this for only $126. That's only $35 a carat. Only $35 a carat, and 
um, I want you to go look. I challenge you. Look at that color. And there it is. You can find this color available in the market. Um, and and then, then you will quickly come back and get that get this stone. There's, these are just really, really, really getting hard to find and are really expensive. Look at that in my hand so you get an idea of size. You know, um, nothing is getting cheaper. And I just um, didn't realize what a um, good thing I had been doing all those years by putting up mineral specimens and gemstones because what I had uh, paid for the, such things and what the market uh, value of them is now is kind of shocking to me, real shocking to me. So it just says, it's like, wow, I called that one right 50 years ago. Let me show you item number 117-5224. Now, this is um, another Mozambique stone. And let's take a look. It has some, again, of the classic color tones that are found coming from the uh, Naipa mine. And I, um, let's take, let's look. So I listed this kind of as a copper color, but you never know what light you're looking at it in. And, you know, <laughs> wow, you, you know what it kind of looks like? It looks like uh, color change diaspora a little bit, huh? Let's get rid of this one. So these are both from the same mine, and they easily are um, covered by the description of the colors that have been coming out of that mine. Uh, so these definitely fall within that range. Now, this guy is, let me hold it with my fingers for a moment. Um, again, a wonderful cut, really nice brilliance. And then you can see a little bit of color zoning, but anymore, to me, I uh, don't mind that a bit. It adds, again, a sense of um, authenticity to it when I see that. And uh, kind of makes me feel more secure in my purchase. <laughs> if I had made one, I have this guy, this is um, a wonderful stone. And one of many colors and uh, looks, so to speak, depending on the lighting conditions and the direction that you're looking at it in. What a beauty, what a beauty. And uh, let me see, just a nice copper color. And you'll find that when you get these stones, if you get them at home, um, that you're going to see them differently than what they, how they are appearing maybe now. And I think all of them will, you'll be much more pleasantly uh, surprised when, when you do. Now, let's look at what is this guy. Oh, oh, 4824. This, this, <laughs> wow, okay. Now, you know I love opal. It's my favorite stone, and it is my son's birthstone and my mother's birthstone, so deep connection to it. Let me show you. This is a continuation of the Koroit opal I showed you from last week, and look at this particular stone, this one particular stone, the cutter did an amazing job because, uh, yes, sir, I can, I will. Let's go back to this copper tourmaline and make sure we get the price on it, which um, is always a good idea because I think I, uh, I forgot. Let me get right, oops, 
Sorry about that. Uh, get back to it. That's the wrong bag there. And okay, what was that? Let me see. Uh, the item number do you have? It's up there. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so used to. Okay, there we go. All right. This one being um, three point. Yeah. So let's do this. How about super special on this one? Seventy-seven dollars. Only seventy-seven dollars on this guy, and don't even know what that is in the price per carat, but I know it is a deal. A deal. Okay. Yep. All right. Now, going back to this Koroi Opal, and now. Croy Opal is actually a, uh, an area, a specific area in Queensland. But what really sets Croy Opal apart from just being Boulder Opal is a particular pattern that is uh, um, noticed and seen in Opal from this area. Now, you can see this is a good thick piece. And look at the color that follows the edge, that, that's really amazing. And as we go around this piece, you can see it uh, is, is good and thick. But this is what's cool, is the cutter, see this little thin rim of color? Look at that. He was able to cut it so that little thin rim of color follows just the very edge, almost completely around. Um, and Look at the center. Look at the intensity of the color. So the red, this is hematite. What you're seeing in the red material is actually a combination of like a red hematite. You can also get a red jasper that uh, comes up in some of this uh, material and also uh, enough hematite that it's actually more shiny, uh, more metallic looking than it is anything else. This piece is different, completely different than normal Croit. Croit will have these kind of patterns that you see right along the edge uh, of this one, unlike, look at that. Look at, look at that on the, on the, that looks like a campfire right there underneath mm, someone boiling in a hot tub or something. Um, look at that, look at that. That is really cool. It, uh, if I was to name this stone, it would have to do uh, something with um, an, an evening under the stars or something. I don't know. That has a combination of the night sky, uh, which I've seen, the Southern Cross uh, in Australia and, uh, and New Zealand, and uh, made out campfires with my, my, my pops. And when we were there, we had, we had a great time. Look, look at all around there. So this is a stunning, really unique stone. Um, and one that you can, um, well, I don't know. There's no two opals ever alike. And there's certainly no two uh, boulder opals that would ever look like that one right there. I'll leave it right there. You get to see a little bit of, of both. And especially for, you're gonna, not going to believe this. Um, <laughs> I'm not really believing why I did it this way either, but um, why not? $68. $68. So if everything is relative, then in my mind as to pricing, then that $68 is the same uh, good of a deal, however you want to say it, as the tourmalines, like the tourmaline I just showed you. Because you know what? I did. I went and I looked at how much these particular tourmaline colors, particular sizes, and I went to my site I use, which is the most inexpensive site for gemstones I have found. And in doing that, I got a good feel for what the retail value of what those tourmalines are going for. I was amazed. It almost tempted me to change the pricing on them, but, but, um, but I didn't. And so 
it is, um, it is what it is, and it is up to you to take advantage and get in on how, um, how low I actually have priced those. Uh, it is a stunning opportunity. And feel free to um, get all of them that you, you can or want because tourmaline, um, I realize, has really gone up in price and uh, there's a lot of reasons for it, a lot of reasons. I just didn't realize how, um, how much the marketplace has um, followed the pricing, um, inflation, whatever you want to call it, uh, or, or just the, the world market. I was really, really kind of shocked. Okay, now, I have something really neat. Item 117 4724. 117 Now, hopefully I won't make a mess with these everywhere. I have uh, it's a parcel of diamonds, and I just have them um, in my own homemade little diamond papers here for you. So let me open these up. These are extremely white. So just to show you, they're all VS in clarity, FG color, and I'm talking really white. And they came um, out of one piece. So they are estate stones, but if they weren't, there's no way I would ever or could ever afford to sell them at what I'm offering for. Earth mine diamonds, <laughs> uh, that is one area that has gotten uh, and gone up, but it also is going to be a much more rare commodity. Okay, so what's in this particular parcel? So what you see uh, by way of total weight is the total weight of both of these. So in this parcel, 2.1 millimeter stones, VSFG color. There is 31 points total weight. So they are, uh, for the total weight, they are exactly what they should be by way of cut. So they are extremely way, well cut. And so you can see right here just how uh, white they are. I'll put them against the white tray and Hopefully they'll look as white as, uh, as they are. And look at how brilliant these gems are. I think um, uh, there's a couple of you or some of you out there that buy up every uh, one of these that kind of deals I put out there, well, very wisely so. It's easily one third to one fifth of what the um, market would be on these. Uh, so you can see the clarity, uh, um, extremely clean, especially for small diamonds like this, just not something that you normally uh, see, and really nicely matched uh, for the color and clarity. So these are the 2.1 millimeter stones, and so I'll put those back in just a moment. Let me show you what we have in my own little homemade paper here is you have 18, they're 1.8 to 2.0 millimeter equal 53 points total weight. Again, same color and clarity and um, probably won't, won't dump all these out, but uh, cause let me just see if I can open this up and uh, you get an idea uh, again, look at how beautiful those are. That, you know, I don't know. I can't help it. I much prefer knowing that this is something that came out of the ground as opposed to a uh, reactor, a furnace. Look at those. So they are very, very white. All right, now. These kind of stones in a wholesale market anymore, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. They're like six to $700 per carat. 
six to seven hundred dollar care. So at 90 points, you'd be looking at, you know, 500, 600, 700 dollars for the parcel. And um, that's that they they'd technically really be worth it at that color and clarity. How about this? A hundred and ninety eight dollars. A hundred and ninety eight dollars. So, you know, that is at 90 points, whatever, uh, a little over 200 a carat, two, 225 a carat maybe, something like that. Wow, that, that is mind-blowingly inexpensive compared to, again, what you would find them for uh, any place else, any place else. I don't care where you go to, no one can compete with Sean's diamond pricing. <laughs> so. Uh, hopefully, for, since the time I took to cut them out and clean them up and remove them from the mounting to keep them that way for you, uh, it'll be worth it and someone will take advantage of that parcel and you get my, uh, maybe, it depends if Christy <laughs> includes my handy dandy little uh, homemade papers for them. Now, let me show you, oh boy. 117-4624, 117-4624. I have a question mark next to Rocket Pocket. Could this possibly be from the Rocket Pocket, which is a name given to a um, particular pocket of the Peternia mine that when they hit it, they hit into some crazy tourmaline. I'm getting ready to show you a could you could you could put museum on it you, you know top gem world class whatever you want to call it it is some of the very finest and as a matter of fact let me take a moment to clean up the turntable i'll be right back bam boy that hit you didn't it didn't expect that one didn't see that one coming no you didn't this um so if we could change that to 2001 to 2002, please, sir. This, this uh, at the Peternia mine, this find uh, was really heard around the world, so to speak, in the uh, mineralogical community when it comes to some of the finest tourmaline ever. Uh, discovered and this stone is most likely uh, could be uh, very well from what was deemed the rocket pocket uh, and because I know how long it's been around and can uh, date it back to at least that time period. So uh, th there is nothing else I can say except for you just to look at the stone because the color is exactly the way it looks. The green is captured perfectly. This is a stone at the highest level of quality. And, and the thing about it is, is I, I'm going to offer this at a mind-numbing discount, but I don't know. It's one of those things that, that should I, you know? I would hope that one of the members of all of you out there will take advantage of this stone and the pricing I'm going to make on it, because if not, then it's going to go to another market and you guys will miss out. It will, the deal on it will be gone. What is that? <laughs> Jeez. And it is simply breathtaking. That green, it is like a, um, I don't know, a Savorite green, a uh, Kelly Green. Look at how clean this is. The only thing I found 
Let me show you, you can probably see it right there, but that's okay, there's a little veil right there. And that's why I'm showing it to you, a little veil. That is okay, <laughs> that tells me that it's the real, the real deal. So there's just a couple little pinpoints in that area. That's it, that's it. And it's huge. Could you imagine the crystal? And they, they said, like the Jonas mine and the Rubelites, that some of the, uh, they couldn't keep every one of those stunning crystals. Just like this, they couldn't keep all the beautiful crystals. They had to re, uh, get a value in cut gemstones out of them. So I would love to have known what the crystal looked like that this came from. Oh, wow. Look at that stone. Look at that. The Petronia mine has produced some amazing, amazing gems. And the greens, along with the pinks. But there was a certain time period that they, uh, that the Petronia mine really uh, hit some amazing, amazing pockets. And this was one of them uh, when what I think that this is from, just from the uh, time frame, it very potentially could be from the rocket pocket. Wow, look at that. I don't know what else to tell you, what else to show you about it. You know enough about tourmaline. You know how rare this color is. It's not the olive green. It is not even a, the valuable color teal green. But you know the problem with teal is, the teal colors, you can't call it green. You can't really call it indicolite, though people often try to, but you know in your heart it's really not if it's teal. And though teal is expensive, it's a confusing color. And whereas this, this, is green. I mean, when I thought of, uh, you know, yeah, there's some yellow when I turn it in one way, but then I turn it another way and it's a pure green. And then, you know, overall, I even saw a little bit of blue in one direction, but, but look at that. Overall, wh wh what is that color? That's green. That is green. If I could grow <laughs> my yard grass that color, I wouldn't have the HOA griping at me. Maybe I'll tell them, I don't know what green looks like. They'll say, look at that tourmaline we saw on your show. And actually, I found out one of my neighbors up the road, yep, even before I knew her, she actually knew the show, which was scary. And when she saw me, she was one of those, I know you. I was like, oh, no. Um, but, um, but that's OK. Ah, uh, what a beautiful, you know, that is a stone you don't even ever have to do anything with. You just admire it. And he, I had it actually in this diamond paper because let me show you. Let me show you. It just looked good, <laughs> even in the diamond paper. Look at that. See what I mean? Imagine, imagine opening up a diamond paper and being one of those people that actually gets to open a diamond paper and that's what's inside of it. Uh, how many people get to do that? Well, you can be one of those too, okay? So you open your diamond paper up, you're showing a friend and you say, look at my latest little bauble. And then they faint and fall down. <laughs> oh man, that is, um, I would tell you more about it, but you don't need to know more about it. You already know all about tourmaline, everything else. Um, you look up the Petronier mine, and you'll find out more about, about the mine. Uh, OK, I guess you want to know the price. And that's one thing I really didn't, didn't uh, know how to work it out, because, you know, you and I both know that a uh, in the range of four and five hundred dollars a carat, absolutely, it, that's not one of those made-up prices. 
That is what I saw these kind of stones. They wasn't anything quite like this. They were smaller, but they were absolutely wanting four and five hundred dollars per carat on those. And uh, <laughs> some even more. I um, wasn't sure what to think about that, but I know one thing I am not going to ask that for, and what I'm going to ask for is such a um, excellent value that there's not, it's not going to be a situation I'm going to be able to um, reduce the price. If anything, it'll end up with another vendor, and it will then definitely have to be sold at a higher price. So here's your one and only chance, and let me get out the calculator on it. And uh, don't normally ever have to do that, but on this one, I, I'm going to. And uh, let's see what we have. We have a 22 point. <laughs> Yeah. Well, <laughs> this is going to be ridiculous. Let's make it $1,648. That is less than $75 a carat. $1,648. I kid you not. And, um, mm, when, uh, yeah, so, I want you to do some homework on price. This stone isn't going to be available for that long, maybe a week. Um, it's not going to be one that's going to be in the uh, uh, available in memo for as long as the others, as, as well as the jewelry. So like I said, it's going to go to another home. But I certainly wish and hope every single one of these pieces finds a home in, in this show, in this show, than any other, because uh, I want you guys to have the first opportunity. And uh, those of you that know value should know just how inexpensive that is. All right, I am running out of time, so let me get to another stunning item. This one is a, another faint and fall down, and you know what? If I was to be one of those that was to use nomenclature that really doesn't matter, I would be using it on this. Let me, let me show you what I'm talking about. Let me show you this. 1175024. And this is some stunning workmanship. <laughs> you thought I was going to say something about the stone. No, I made this ring. The workmanship is what you look at first. Then, the gem. Okay, now we'll get to the gem. This S99S, again, made this in 99. You can see this is cla my classic type of styling, my nice, thick, wide bail. You can also see the tooling uh, semicircular marks around that. That is also a sign of handmade piece. I hand carved the wax. I cast it. Look at this. Yeah, you see, I'm still not even talking about the tans tonight. Now, what would I say about the tans tonight that you guys don't know? No, there's nothing that you guys don't know about, except I could use the superlatives of super dark double triple neon plus with ice cream and a cherry on top, um, all from the D block. I could say that, but I think you know me better than that by now. Maybe the red flashes. Yeah, red flashes, absolutely. Oh, I do. Red flash. No. Oh, oh, I just saw the violet, the pinks. Yep, you are right. The red flashes are happening. The lavenders, the pinks. Here is what you want a tanzanite to look like. You want it to look like the finest color you would ever want in a sapphire. And then you want the saturation level to be exactly what it is. Not so dark that it cuts down on the brilliance, not so light that it takes it out of the really high-end quality. And this is that really high-end quality. Uh, you know, <laughs> what more can be said? That there's nothing to apologize for in this Tanzanite. 
it's amazing that as an estate piece that it's because it can't be taken out um, and faceted that it doesn't have any wear or tear up around the table. There's a little spot at the edge of the bezel, but if you're not seeing it, I'm not going to point it out. But I'm just telling you to look for it because then again, if it goes through all that and you don't see it, then it's, uh, I don't think it's significant enough that I need to try to, to hand polish it a little bit out or not. Now, yeah, exactly. It tells you exactly that it is a handmade oh, piece. Look at the craftsmanship. Yeah, on this, absolutely. As also said, look at the craftsmanship because it's handmade also. Handmade. And look at the perfection. And that's why I said at the beginning, I was looking at the piece, not the stone. Because actually, I am more proud of the handmade piece than um, offering, being able to offer you that tanzanite. Now, if we talk about the tanzanite, I do want to use a comparison factor. Have you really ever seen one prettier in this size that's going to be affordable? No, no. This, to me, is what I would want my tanzanite to look at. Too much lavender and purple, then it gets into a completely different uh, color range and valuation. If you actually know tanzanite and know how to value them, which I'm sure there's some of you watching, you're going to say, that's the prettiest tanzanite I think I've ever seen. Because it does have that look of some of the finest, finest, finest sapphire. Except it doesn't have the zoning. It doesn't have the inclusion. It doesn't have all the other things. Look at it from the back. Tanzanite. <laughs> exactly. Tanzanite is a type 1 gemstone. It's eight, this is 18 karat, by the way. 18 karat gold. A type 1 gemstone is a gemstone that is found most often without inclusions. So that looks brand new. it does. <laughs> this does look brand new. And uh, <laughs> uh, what a beauty. What a beauty. You know, a well-cut gemstone, when you put your hand behind it or anything else, should not cut down on the brilliance at all. All the light should enter and be reflected back out the top of the stone. Look at that. You, it doesn't darken the stone at all. That's why this type of pendant worn against the chest, you don't have to worry about it getting any darker. I can, look at, I can move those fingers away. It doesn't, look at, it does not change the brilliance or the level of lighting or the color at all. That is because all that light is entering and coming back out the top. It, it's not coming, it's not getting light from behind. It's not even getting light from those open uh, galleries. Look at that. That is perfection. And also, if you were wondering, ah, I see you didn't see it. There it is, S99S. That was a big year for me. I, I, I did a lot. I had to stay busy. Um, that was, and I did, and this was one of the pieces. I could always put the mill grain edge around it, the beadwork, if you wanted it. Um, I would just only put it like on this outer edge here, not, wouldn't dare put it uh, on, against the stone. But, um, uh, you know, I can, um, even rhodium played it probably for you, but this 18 karat with that tanzanite, there's nothing that better than that. Now, let me put it right there for a moment. And um, I, I don't really know how to um, price this guy. Look at that. That is royal. That is. <laughs> Trying to get it to lean against something. There. Good enough. Yo, look at the little diamond. Look at diamonds everywhere. Diamonds everywhere. I saw that guy earlier. It was on the uh, on the table. But that's that's what you find when you work at Jim Shopping. Jewels, jewels. <laughs> All right, price on this guy. I I I I don't know. I really don't. I what what is it going to be? Um, since I uh, especially lost uh, my my info on it. Um, okay, so. Here's, okay, if you have a 12.60 carat, if that tanzanite, if I price that tanzanite at $500 a carat and everything else would be free, you'd be looking at $6,300. And that's only $500 a carat. 
and you get all the 18 carat, all the diamonds for you. Carat eight of diamonds, and the diamonds are real high grade quality. Um, really fine. VS in clarity and uh, GH in color are better. All right, that's 500 a carat. What if we go 400 a carat? 400 a carat at 12.60, 48 and 240, that's $5,040, and you get all the gold and diamonds for free. And that is a world-class tanzanite, which if there was a, such a thing as a D block that was supposed to be better and nicer, well, that, th this would be from the D block. Maybe even the EFG block. That's probably even better. No, really, it, it, tanzanite is what it is, and by sheer look is how a lot of people will determine whether it's valuable to them or not. And this tanzanite gives nothing to, the, uh, to a detractor that wants to find something wrong with it. They will not find anything wrong with it. Therefore, it really is in the top evaluation. If this piece, wow. I, I tell you what, I, I don't know where to go from, from the, uh, the 400 care and everything else is free part. Um, uh, I, uh, math in the head is probably not something I should do under critical moments like this, but I tell you what, um, make, let's keep it clean and simple. $3,780, $3,780, that's $300 a carat and everything else is free. How would you like to buy that Tanzanite? I know those of you that paid $1,000 a carat for your Tanzanite that looks like that, I'm sorry. This, believe me, this, that price does not reflect the value of the Tanzanite itself. It reflects my ability to offer you a deal that you will never ever find better than that. That is a opportunity that you need to move on it and that green tourmaline. It's time to break the piggy bank. Let me show you item number 1174124. Yeah, this, let me just show it to you against my hand so you can see relative size. This is striking. Look at that. Honest, uh, uh, Asif, you have seen a lot of Tanzanite. You, yeah, I was gonna say. It gives you the sapphire feeling. It does. It doesn't give you the purple. Nope. Real exactly. I also just nailed it. It gives you the sapphire feeling. It doesn't have the purple in it that instantly screams, I'm a Tanzanite. No. If someone, if you have this on your neck, their first guess isn't even going to be Tanzanite. If you are used to wearing more valuable jewelry, for me, I look at that and I see the color of a really fine high-end Burmese sapphire. And um, that's, that's the color I see. 37, that's 300 a carat and all the diamonds, all the labor is thrown in, all the gold. Have you seen what gold has done lately? And this is 18 carat gold. Let's figure that out in itself. 13 grams, 18 carat, just the melt value of it. Okay, let's do that. Just the melt value of gold at 18 karat right now is roughly around 52, well, it was $56 a gram. Let's see, uh, five, 650, let's say there's $700 worth of gold. Let's say you round it off to set about 780. So we're down to $3,000. So because you have exactly that in the melt. The diamonds, what? Wholesale cost on those? That's a, um, easily another five or $600. You're down to $2,400. In other words, you're down to less than $200 on the Tanzanite. Scrap on the gold and wholesale cost on the diamonds and nothing for labor. Because That's... So yeah. <laughs> Not, <laughs> awesome. You're going to break my heart. He said the discount for the craftsmanship. Awesome. <laughs>
How dare you? Yeah, and that's why Asif gave me a ring for me to do for him. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. Well, right. Exactly. Good point. What he is saying is you're not getting a regular Joe's craftsmanship for free. You're getting my craftsmanship for free. And there you go. You're not getting the house painter. You're getting Michelangelo. And I have to say that for a custom handmade piece, that that is about as dog doggone perfect as you're going to find. Let's and uh, scrap it for gold. yeah. Yeah, let's, scrap it for parts. yeah, let's just scrap it for parts. No, I, I could never do that one. Never do that one. That's just stunning. Okay, now, oh, let's look at item 1174124. And this, 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 this is another one of those Australian beauties. Look at that. Look at that. Okay, now another Croy opal. You're saying, but I don't see that Croy powder. Yeah, well, we didn't look close enough. As we go in a little closer on this, let's just give you a quick spin as we look closer. And this is a neat little model pattern, not normally what you see of Croy opal. Look at that down here. But as we turn this around, oh, look at all those colors. Um, you see a little bit of the red hematite coming around here. And then look at that. Here we go. Here we go. Look at all those little purple sparkles. Here's that classic pattern that we see on the very edge of that that is reminiscent and uh, uh, definitely typical of Croy. Oh, look at that little open spot in there. That is pretty neat. <laughs> it gives you, uh, put a little light in there, light it up. No, look at this. All right, here is a... You know, that's easily drilled right up there, and all you have to do is put a ring or a bale through there, and you have a pendant, and you're good to go. Because this can be easily and safely worn on the neck. That is striking. And can you believe it? How about this? That stone, that big stone, for only $118. Look at that in my hand. Look at that. As we come back away from it, you're going to see just how large that is and how showy. Look at that. From a distance, you can see all that color and fire. That is a beauty. 118. Don't even know how price per care. And probably the last item of the show, 117, 49, 24. Did I save best for last? No, no. I definitely didn't save the best for the last, but this isn't too shabby for what it is. Look at this. Now, I have to admit, I did not make this one, but I had a lot of else, uh, other things to do with it. Look at that. When Asif saw this, he uh, just, um, wow. yeah, yeah. That was, that's, that's a wow. This is some of the finest clarity in a, Mandarin specialty garnet you're going to find. The um, specialty are known to have a, a whole lot of these dust-like inclusions in them. You don't really see it until you loop them, and then you get all these little inclusions. Oh, I didn't see this, which is fine. That's accepted, but this. This stone does not have those. I actually made sure I had to check and do all the checking with it uh, to make sure that it was a specertine and not um, a citrine or something else. So, hold on. Yeah, exactly. But wait, ah, you're, but wait, awesome. You're blowing the whole, my, my setup. Yeah, so to check Specertine we know, now I haven't done this, so I'm not sure, I'm just hoping it works. Specertine is a manganese garnet. Manganese is magnetic. And as we approach this, boom! I'm sure glad that worked awesome because I hadn't done that prior. You put metal in the mouth. I, know. I had not done that prior. I, I should did screen test. I should screen test before I embarrass myself, but no, I had faith. Bam, there we go. Right there, ladies and gentlemen. Isn't that cool? Right there tells you that it is a specialty garnet. A simple, a test, it's not just simple. You have to have a neodymium magnet. And if it was, if it was loose, it would have come faster because it didn't have to carry the weight of the mouth. 
True. Oh, that's very true. Uh, Asif made a good point because this was actually on its side, creating the most drag possible with the tag. And if, the, like he said, if the stone would have been loose and not hauling how many grams of gold behind it, 5.70 grams of gold behind it, that stone would have probably come two inches flying across there to the magnet. Okay, I'm exaggerating a little. It's a fish story, okay? When it comes to the magnetism. But, um, uh, but to carry all that weight and be able to do that, you know, it's uh, so yeah, manganese is a very, it's actually um, a particular valence of manganese, but, uh, but that is one way in this situation to be able to make sure you're checking it for everything uh, that it's not. So it's not citrine, it's not sapphire, it's gorgeous. It is gorgeous. Um, Look at the size. Like if you put it on his belly again, or find another way. Yeah. On his back. Yep. See it right there? Just turn it. Oh, yep. See that fire? Or pick it up and then yep. it again and turn it towards the camera. You'll see that fire come out. I have seen that fire in several um, instances. Right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. Yeah. There, there, there you go. Yep. 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 And uh, so this, this is a, a real a really fine um, clarity stone. Uh, I have to fess up, it's custom made, but it's not custom made by Sean. So, um, no, this is the only one of those. I showed Asif the box, because I was going down and, and I was steaming them, and he couldn't believe it. He goes, which ones have you, did, have you made? And I said, well, I made them all, but, but then I didn't have a chance to tell him except this one. But it's extremely fine. All right, let me give you the price, and then that uh, will have to roll. Um, okay, so that would be good if I could, um, again, whew, all right, here, you're not going to believe it. You know, and I priced these, this level of quality of Mandarin, and again, for price per carat, what I'm asking <laughs> with the gold and the diamonds, unheard of, only $788 for the entire piece, 788 that's a 403 you at that's less than 200 a carat on this on the mandarin and everything else being free you're not going to find that deal all right there is a gem along with so many others all right um i'll be back with a trivia well wasn't that a lot of fun it always is when you know you have someone like me passionate about what i'm offering and someone like you passionate about what you're seeing. And I can just feel the energy on your side and some of the mouths dropping as well. So um, we have a um, fun and different trivia we're gonna do. But before that, I just want to recap on something and show you in one shot some of Mother Nature's finest. These are stunning, as you know, and as you saw. And all I want to say is that, you know, I priced them at such a bargain. There's really nowhere to go. But if you're interested in a couple of them, or if there's just, you know, something that would um, make you want to say, yeah, I need that, especially at the price he's offering it, if there's anything holding you back from making a deal, then leave me a comment or call into customer service and they will um, find me, put it that way. <laughs> they will find me. So uh, with that said, I'm gonna leave those in the background because what I'm going to show you next is gonna be in the foreground in front of them. And it's gonna be the trivia question. And it's going to be what am I again? So let's take a look. Yep. So let me just put these back a little bit. Let me move this incredible tourmaline gem back a little. And then here we go. Now, no, it is uh, not quite what you were seeing, but it was what I was wearing. We're going to call this the one on the left and the other one the one on the right. And this is as simple as what am I? Now, let me get my flashlight so I can just show you as uh, a little bit more. 
uh, info what you might need to see. All right, so I'm backlighting that. I'm going to be like uh, the um, the uh, storage rental places. You get about two minutes to look inside. And then here is this one. You can see they're both green stones, and that's all the information <laughs> you get. You know them both. Tell me which is what and as much information as you can. The one on the left is what and the one on the right is what. So a little something different and we like to uh, keep it that way. All right and for those of you looking forward to doing the crystal growing I am putting that plan together and in motion but for right now I am um, enveloped in a level of excitement that I hadn't felt in a while because to get back items that I made, you saw, last, what do we call it, last millennial, last millennia, something like that. That's pretty cool, huh? I think for me, because I don't have time to make those kind of pieces, my eyes, my back, everything. So I love it that the trust and faith in my clients going back decades and now another generation moving into it, but they know, they know me, I've sold them their engagement rings, etc trusting me to handle this for them. And I, of course, I'm honored and I'm excited to have um, Sean made pieces to offer now all of you. Take advantage of them while they're available. Um, there's really not, uh, well, there's a couple few other things, but Sean made items. I don't know if there's much of any of those left, but I do have other goodies coming up for you each week. Take advantage of the ones you see now, though, because what you saw in today's show will not be available, uh, especially some of these other nicer uh, higher end pieces will not be available for the entire extended normal time of the, um, of, of the quote, memo. It's a shorter time frame because they're going to go somewhere else if, um, if all of you don't buy them. I really would prefer all of you to buy them because once they leave me, I don't actually know the end buyer. I will not know where they wind up. And you know, I kind of like some of to, to find out some of that. So, okay, all of you, uh, enjoy your spring, stay safe, and um, know that I love each and every one of you, and I wouldn't be here with, without all of your kind support and love. And um, yeah, I feel it. Take care, and I can't wait to see you next Monday. Cheers.